هل سنبدا ولا اه oh, اوكي okay. uh, we are live now uh, مرحبا uh, السلام عليكم and good afternoon everyone uh, welcome to the third day of the uh, first annual symposium of islamic art and architecture today we have uh, our wonderful keynote speakers uh, just a quick recap uh, for whoever missed um, the first two days of, of this symposium and this event. Uh, so this symposium is the first that we have arranged as Department of Architecture and Interior Design, and it's prepared by the Cultural Collaboration Committee. Uh, this is celebrating the, uh, um, the uh, November 18th, as the International Day of Islamic Art. And this uh, proclamation um, celebrates the role and the contribution of Islamic art uh, to world architecture and world culture with a history that spans over uh, 1,400 1, years. And this is actually a proposal that was uh, organized by Bahrain Kingdom uh, um, to UNESCO uh, General Conference, and it was approved uh, from this year onward to be the International Day for Islamic Art. Now I have uh, our guest speakers over here. Um, um, we are so lucky to have them to uh, talk about uh, one of our favorite subjects, with it, which is Islamic art and architecture. Uh, some of the things that we already highlighted and will be highlighted today as well and over also on Saturday would be the future of mosque architecture in the Arabian Gulf, uh, symbolism in Islamic art and architecture, light and spirituality in Islamic architectural heritage, and the current trends in the Islamic designs. Now, um, our first um, uh, keynote speaker is Professor Mshari Naim. He is Secretary General of Abdel Latif Al Fawzan Award for Mosque Architecture. And uh, Professor Naim has uh, lifelong achievements in the subject we are addressing today. So whatever I will select from his bio will not be fair, but here it goes. Uh, professor Naim is an architect and urban planner. He is a professor of architecture at Imam Abdul Rahman bin Faisal University and a former general supervisor of the National Built Heritage Center at the Saudi Commission of uh, Tourism and Antiquity. So uh, Professor Naim is a former deputy director of Prince Mohammed bin Fahad University and the former head of the, the Department of Architecture. He founded the National Belt Heritage Center from 2011 to 2018 to become a national and regional institution for the architectural heritage for both academic and professional practice. During the last two decades, Professor Naim worked as a consultant and a practitioner for many of the architectural and planning major projects in Saudi Arabia and in the region. He participated in several studies with specialized institutes and centers in the world in the fields of urban studies. One of them was his particip participation with Alahan Foundation as a member of a specialized team to study the architectural education in the Islamic world. Furthermore, Professor Naim is a writer specialized in architecture and in urbanism. And in the last two, two decades, he published hundreds of researches and articles in the field of architecture in both Arabic and English. Uh, our virtual audience and attendees, please help me in welcoming Professor Mshari Naim. Professor Mshari, over to you. Okay, thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, yeah, I'm really very happy to be with you today. <clears throat> I don't know if you hear me properly or... Uh, my presentation will be both in Arabic and English. Okay, I prepare my presentation in Arabic. But uh, I will try to uh, make it as much as possible uh, clear and understandable for the English speakers. Uh, I will share with you today uh, one uh, important, from my point of view, experience 
in um, uh, Islamic architecture uh, or education of Islamic architecture. And this experience, uh, and I, try, uh, I applied, I tried to conduct with my students last semester and this semester. And uh, before I started this uh, presentation about yani, the mosque as incubator for Islamic art, I will start with this uh, experience. Let me open the file. Because I'm trying to find the file. Uh, let me Okay. I will share I will share this file again. And I will go, I'll go back again to uh, I don't know if it's uh, clear. You can see this is a timeline. I know it's very tiny and maybe <laughs> no, nobody can see, but uh, let me try to magnify what we did in fact uh, and why we did this uh, spatial temporal path for yani, Islamic uh, architecture through yani, by studying one yani, uh, building type, which is the mosque. And we we tried in the during the semester. Fortunately, last semester, and I had uh, 49 uh, students, and this gave me a, a good chance uh, to uh, give each students one mosque only. And uh, every two students, they selected two mosques from every uh, uh, century. I I mean by century, it's a Hijri century. Al-Qurun uh, al and we tried to build up a spatial temporal path to uh, investigate the origin of forms and how the architectural forms uh, uh, were born and developed and uh, mixed with other uh, uh, elements and forms and created a new forms. And this uh, yani, uh, diachronic study crossed by synchronic deep analysis for each century to understand the political, the economic, the socio-cultural, and the environmental, including geography, okay, uh, and, uh, forces that and, uh, led to the, uh, the, the bone of these uh, and the forms and uh, uh, and the to and he urge the students to go and the you know the and in general you know the students that you know this method was very important for uh, for me because uh, from my reading in Islamic uh, uh, art and architecture. Most of the literature is very descriptive. In fact, few analytical uh, yani writing about uh, yani Islamic art and architecture. And uh, yani it's maybe we cannot find any single source uh, tried to investigate the origin of forms that uh, yani emerged and developed in the uh, Islamic civilization during the past 14 centuries. And this is really very unfortunate and this is very sad because yani, uh, most, most of the literature also is written by the foreigners and uh, uh, mainly they try to yani, squeeze the Islamic uh, uh, civilization in uh, a term like Islamic architecture, 
which the yani, sense of time is not exist in that uh, in this term, okay, or in this uh, notion. And I think, uh, uh, yani, why not trying to uh, develop a method? Why not uh, trying to yani, uh, change this uh, tradition to a new paradigm? Yani, you can consider this my understanding of the new paradigm uh, to study uh, uh, Islamic art and architecture. And uh, I should uh, yani say clearly that the, yani the, the notion of Islamic architecture uh, yani is, I had a lot of yani, uh, critique and uh, yani, uh, objections and, on, on that uh, notion because I don't think it reflects the, uh, the, the depth and the, yani, uh, the geography, the time span of Islamic civilization. But in any way, this notion is spread and known, and we need to change the, the meaning of this notion rather than uh, changing the notion itself. Okay, maybe yani, some people will consider this um, yani, some uh, a change in, in my position towards the Islamic architecture. But in fact, I tried very hard in the past few years to uh, change the, the understanding of uh, the meaning of Islamic architecture. But unfortunately, it's uh, yani, the, the external forces, the foreigners, those who yani, build, built this uh, uh, notion is uh, much, much stronger than what we able to do in this region and in the Arabic world, unfortunately. Uh, in fact, let me take you on a quick tour in this. Uh, I don't know how to. Uh, uh, you will see this, uh, this time span has يعني, covered 14 centuries and uh, each century has uh, two examples and I asked the students to uh, يعني, first to have their individual work. The individual work is to concentrate on the examples they selected in each century and go back to the, its origin, not to uh, its uh, يعني, condition today, because may, you, you know that uh, most of the uh, يعني, buildings in uh, Islamic civilization have layers. Uh, the, uh, and you know, the, the, uh, يعني, uh, in fact, uh, يعني, the Islamic character characterized by this layer, layer characteristics that the building يعني, include a lot of, يعني, uh, layers from different uh, times, which make which make it difficult to go back to its origin. We tried very hard to go, يعني, uh, back to the origin of the building, trying to dismantle. We use the the technique of dismantling and mantling. And I don't know if some of you knows uh, Amos Rapaport. Amos Rapaport, uh, يعني, in his writing, in most of his writing, he used the uh, يعني, concept of uh, dismantling and mantling. يعني, he dismantled the architectural and the urban phenomenon, and uh, then he mantled this, uh, what he dismantled, and but in a uh, different from its um, original uh, condition which make it يعني, يعني, يعني possible to uh, generate new ideas and concepts. And this is what we tried uh, through this uh, method because uh, I didn't see any similar method يعني, uh, applied before to analyze the, the Islamic art and architecture because يعني mostly, as I said, it's very descriptive. 
and uh, concentrate on symbol symbolism like uh, Oleg Grabar and I think uh, 20 years or more the uh, yani years ago he wrote uh, a paper about simple symbols in Islamic uh, art and architecture and he said uh, there is no symbols in Islamic art there is no high yani uh, vaulted he said he, no high vaulted uh, uh, symbols in Islamic architecture and mostly it's uh, very superficial and uh, usually uh, I don't know if he's right or wrong but uh, uh, yani I think uh, he has the authority to say anything and the people will uh, yani believe him he's, because he's, he did a lot of work in, about Islamic art and architecture. Uh, the purpose of this method is to discover when the new elements appeared in Islamic architecture and how was developed through time and how was integrated and became a an hybrid form because it's integrated with other forms and when it was moved from one place to another and uh, yani associated with the different technology and different functions and uh, in the in the end yani, uh, how the form itself is, uh, was disappeared or yani khalas uh, yani kul shakl mat wa asbah yani fi hal shaykhukha it became an old and uh, no, يعني, uh, not anymore يعني, used, okay, and the new forms uh, uh, replaced, uh, replaced it. And, uh, you know, I, I call this the, the يعني, you can say life and death of architectural form, okay? And uh, it's a cycle, life cycle of the architectural form. Okay, well, I published the paper in Alam al Fikr al Kuwaiti a long time ago. And it was uh, يعني, developed from my يعني, PhD because my PhD dissertation 22 years ago, it was about this uh, life cycle of forms and how the forms uh, appear and uh, how it was uh, uh, the, the, the forms, how uh, يعني, became. Uh, يعني, dominating the the scene of architecture, then how it uh, became uh, hybrid when it was integrated with other forms. Then why the some forms continued and why some forms disappeared. Uh, uh, I think this uh, method is uh, interesting. And you know, on the, the the upper part, I don't know if if you see my the, the the cursor. You see, you see what uh, where I I put the cursor. Yes, we we do. Yeah, yeah. These these lines. I know it's not uh, clear enough, but uh, because it's uh, it's, uh, يعني, uh, a lot, and it's very heavy uh, file. Okay, I tried my best to make it as clear as possible. Okay, uh, uh, these uh, lines is it's about the dynasties. The, for example, from the the Prophet time until the Khulafa Rashidin, then Umayyad, Abbasid, and the, the other uh, dynasties that appeared in the Abbasid. And by this, يعني, uh, uh, the chronicle uh, study, you will discover how the forms was developed in which place and by which يعني, uh, يعني leaders and uh, who thought about this form and why they thought about it. Uh, it doesn't mean that this uh, diagram you see here is uh, answered all these uh, questions. In fact, uh, يعني this is uh, uh, just the beginning and we, uh, this was last year and uh, the undergraduate program uh, it's a history and theory of architecture three 
it's about Islamic architecture. And uh, I try to change the, the content of the course from a theoretical and yeah, spoon feeding approach to yeah, more uh, yeah, uh, practical problem solving and the approach to let the students, from my experience, any theoretical courses, if you are lecturing to students, they will forget uh, uh, when you ask them the next uh, yeah, the lecture, most of these students will not remember 60% of what you have said a week ago. And, but by yani, yani participating in uh, an individual and yani teamwork, because the individual work will yani teach the students how to yani learn a deep case study, but uh, the collective and uh, teamwork will uh, teach e every student how the case study he already yani, uh, uh, investigated and studied, okay, is connected with the yani, pre and post, before and after. Yani, uh, yani before the influence the decisions and the um, uh, the uh, any uh, architects image and the techniques that uh, c generated uh, the case he studied and what he already did is influence the yani uh, the later uh, yani cases and uh, uh, in this case I asked each student to meet, for example, in this case, he should meet with this, with his colleague, the one before and after. And this one also, he should meet with this one and this one. That's mean, it's a very collaborative work. Uh, this is from an educational point of view. But uh, from a study of Islamic architecture, it's really helped a lot to generate a uh, uh, lot of uh, ideas and try to uh, yani, uh, yani direct the students to see the, uh, yani how the architecture is emerged and how it, uh, the architecture is born and how, how it was developed. And uh, the elements, it's not something parachuted and from, okay, it's uh, something uh, born in the local, certain local environment and spread because it's accepted by the most of the uh, Islamic communities. Uh, they saw, saw this uh, element is uh, suit their, uh, uh, their image about uh, uh, built environment. This is why they applied it, okay. Uh, I spend uh, yeah, a lot of time in this uh, image. Let me go back to, uh, yani, I don't know if, if you have any uh, uh, yani questions before I go to the uh, other uh, presentation, the other part of the presentation. You can go ahead, Professor Mshari. I have lots of questions for this one, but I'll keep it at the end. <laughs> okay. Okay, let me... Uh, uh, Yeah, okay, this is a. I will go over how many times I have because uh, I already spent uh, 25 minutes now in the in the first uh, slide. It's okay, Doctor. You can go ahead. We can still have like 10, 15 minutes. Oh, uh, 10, 15 minutes. We're we're so interested. So by all means, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, 
In fact, I will uh, I will not talk about the uh, you know, Fozan award for nature, and uh, but I will uh, maybe in the last five minutes I will talk about this uh, title, which is the the architecture of the 21st century. Okay, a glimpse of uh, the most architecture or the crisis of most architecture. Okay. And as I said from the beginning, the mosque architecture, mosque is the incubator. It was the lab of Islamic art and architecture. Most of the elements, either visual, structural, and even the material techniques were developed starting from the mosque architecture, which was the main building and spread to other uh, buildings. And uh, if you uh, want to, to to study يعني, Islamic architecture, we should start with the mosque architecture. Otherwise, it will be يعني, because even the location of the mosque and its uh, relationship with the surrounding, okay, is very influential, especially the orientation, because you know the orientation of the mosque is different from one place to another. And this influenced the urban uh, يعني, matrix of uh, Arab Islamic cities over centuries. Uh, this slide is, in fact, it's, 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 you can consider this also a separate slide. Uh, it's really connected to the, the previous uh, uh, spatial temporal uh, bag. And uh, this is, uh, يعني, uh, I call it the tw 12 points for uh, uh, يعني, uh, يعني architecture critic, okay, uh, method, okay, or towards a methodology for architectural critic, okay. And I consider these uh, four, 12 points is very important. And I ask each student to يعني, try to answer uh, this uh, uh, every point as much as you can because in the end we are the more the students is uh, undergraduate students the time is only four months 16 weeks and uh, yeah, and, uh they have design studios and other courses and uh, i cannot consider the this uh, course is the everything in, for the students okay this is why uh, there were a lot of difficulties most of the students yani, passed through to answer this uh, question. And I divided these uh, 12 points into four uh, categories. The first category is about the, it's, it's the reasons of the existence of architecture, how the, the architecture is yani, emerged. And uh, I, uh, yani, uh, uh, said that uh, there are three important يعني, reasons that يعني, lead to the ex existence or the emergence of architecture. The first reason is the, the availability of uh, resources. And I, 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 يعني, me, I meant by the resources is that the, the financial resources and the uh, materials and uh, natural resources and these you can you can expand in the resources and you, you can consider the second point is part of the resources but just to make it uh, يعني, clear i divide it between the first point and second one okay? uh, you can you can just imagine that most of the cities most of the cities that يعني, contain uh, valuable architecture in Islamic civilization where the, the big يعني, urban uh, cities which were either يعني, يعني, became a capital for different dynasties or they are يعني, very close to the political uh, يعني, uh, يعني, and economic uh, uh, centers, and uh, uh, these uh, this is very important 
uh, to consider uh, architecture. We, uh, the, uh, for example, uh, GCC countries now, uh, uh, because of the financial resources, uh, they have developed their own uh, cities in the past, uh, at least in the past 30 years, it's a huge يعني, uh, uh, development compared to other uh, uh, regions which have uh, less resources than the GCC countries. The second, the second reason is the uh, the the know-how, and I know that all of you know the meaning of know-how. It's the skills, the craftsmanship, the experiences, the the ability to. Yeah, uh, to 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 work with the with the natural uh, resources and materials and transfer them to uh, to an art and uh, to uh, to 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 build and to to, to create uh, art. Okay, and the third reason for the first category is the leadership. Okay, the decision maker. You cannot يعني, have a real uh, architecture without uh, يعني, a decision making uh, يعني, uh, set up, uh, organization, uh, leaders, okay? But uh, you know, in most of the uh, يعني, Islamic, uh, Arabic Islamic cities where uh, have يعني, two different layers of decision-making process. The, uh, the macro, which is the leadership, where, where the monumental buildings are uh, constructed by the leaders, uh, and the micro, where the neighborhoods and the houses and the local mosques which is really is it's 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 a self independent uh, and uh, governing uh, areas within the city uh, but they cannot yeah, they, uh, overcome or they can, cannot uh, uh, do uh, anything that the leaders or the governor of the city uh, yeah, they, uh, Again, it's the governor of the city, which, which make it يعني, very flexible for the people to build their own buildings and easy for the governors to build their own monumental building. And, uh, you know, you know, uh, we, uh, I can, we can write a, a book about the, 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 يعني, the third point because most of the monumental buildings and uh, 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 yani, uh, the separation between the mosque and the political influence uh, was uh, uh, started by the leaders. Okay, and you know Ali ibn Abi Talib when he moved to Al Kufa, he separated uh, the mosque from the governor, uh, yani house, and the mosque became for worship and some, uh, yani, uh, social and. Uh, cultural uh, functions while the governor house, although it was very yeah, connected and very close to the mosque, but it was a start to separate the mosque from the, from the uh, political uh, role. And it was very early uh, separation. Okay, anyway, uh, I asked students to, yeah, uh, to analyze the uh, mosque they selected according to this 12, 12 points. The second category, it's about the, the architecture itself. Architecture is how the architecture is emerged. The, this is the reasons of the emergence. This is how it's emerged. The first one is the lahdat al-ilham. I call it lahdat al-ilham. How the concept comes. The, the concept, inspiration, and the process. Uh, I call the creativity is different from inspiration, and the creativity is not the the real يعني, concept. The, creati the creativity is how to make the concept is creative, how to make it the best possible. And I consider the creativity is part of the process rather than part of the inspiration. 
Well, and in the end, we have the architecture, the product, and the product here is leading to the third category, which uh, were mentioned by Vitruvius as the function, firmness, and the aesthetic. This is the, the characteristics of the architecture. If you want to produce something, you should, uh, you should have the, the function, and it should, it should be re very strongly related to the mosque, for example, because I selected the mosque as an example, but I'm sure there are a lot of you know, building types that can be you know, used in, in this case. And, uh, and uh, the firmness, the what types of uh, the structural techniques that were developed over time and how it was you know, associated with the function and aesthetics. For example, the Muqarnas was, uh, was uh, a structural system and by time became only aesthetic system, decorative system. But originally it was developed as a structural system. And you will discover a lot of يعني, elements that were يعني, uh, born to serve certain function, but by the time uh, used for other things. Okay. And in the, the third category, which should be the first Thing they sh should start with, okay, but I consider it here the fourth because I consider uh, it started with the, with the existence and then to the wider يعني, uh, يعني, uh, impact of the, the architectural uh, uh, يعني element. Okay, very simple. The last one we have the harmony with the urban context and the orientation. And I consider the orientation is very important. And this is the this is the, the, the this is the real character of the Arabic Islamic cities. The orientation is uh, something is really uh, noticeable in Islam, Arabic Islamic cities. Then the urban and uh, connectedness and uh, and the contacts, uh, visual contacts, uh, uh, through this uh, irregular uh, alleys in the Arabic Islamic cities. Uh, in general, today I am trying. Yeah, I mean, this is this is my mission today is to to just let you know about these two um, the, the method and how can we really uh, generate uh, new ideas uh, through especially where you are in the uh, يعني, architectural department, and uh, I'm sure you have uh, uh, hist uh, history courses, and uh, uh, يعني, most of the teaching of history courses uh, is uh, يعني, uh, very descriptive and try to give students information rather than techniques to يعني, uh, dismantle and build the, the يعني personal uh, يعني, uh, views about uh, Arabic Islamic architecture. And uh, يعني in, the, in the end of this presentation, and I will go quickly, okay. Uh, يعني the, the mosque, which was the, uh, the, the, the source and the generative source of elements and techniques, uh, aesthetics, and decoration, is really faced a big problem in the past uh, 200 years, okay? Almost uh, from the mid of uh, 19th century. While Europe, Europe okay, yeah, they uh, have their own art and the craft movement by William Morris and uh, yeah, they, the big heads of uh, Chicago school and towards the end of the century, uh, the Arabic, uh, Re Arab regions and the Islamic region is really uh, is, uh, backwarded and they don't have any, any, uh, any tradition uh, uh, that uh, maintain their uh, any history and heritage. Uh, uh, I divided the, يعني, the, the crisis of يعني, most architecture in the 20th century Okay, into three يعني, uh, periods. The 
first period is in the uh, first half of the century, okay, where uh, the yani, copy and paste uh, of the yani, historical uh, images is uh, dominating the uh, most of the yani, practices uh, at that time. One of them is uh, Paris Mosque and other mosque, okay. This is Paris Mosque. Okay, the other mosque is uh, in uh, Yemen. Okay, and I like this mosque. It's uh, it's really a wonderful mosque. Okay, and uh, uh, you know this is a, a unique uh, minaret in, uh, in Hadramut. Okay, and uh, both of them built in the first two decades of the 20th century, and uh, but still uh, the, yani yeah, the copy and base and the influence of uh, uh, history is uh, strong. Uh, the second second uh, uh, periods between 1950 and 1980, and you know the this uh, mosque. It's in the Kuala Lumpur. It's uh, the national mosque, and uh, I met the designer. I forget its its name. It's it's written anyway in the in the, in the book. Okay, uh, but uh, I forget its name. It's 90 years old, and he designed this uh, building. It's an uh, 1954, and when you visit this uh, mosque, it's really amazing modern architecture. And I think it was, uh, yani, it's a milestone in, in, in mosque architecture at that time because, you know, he, he used the yani, essence of the uh, yani, South e e Eastern Asia's. Uh, uh, traditions by raising the mosque from the ground to let the rains go through without because you know it's a heavy rain uh, region and uh, you know the and consider these columns like uh, uh, coconut uh, yani, palm trees and but it's a purely modern yani mosque with uh, with uh, yani uh, different uh, yani, uh, message to to the whole world at that time. Uh, unfortunately, and a few examples were built at that time between 1950 and 1980. And, uh, but, uh, some, some of these examples is scattered in a different part of the world. I think one of them is, uh, uh, or some of them in, in the United States, and uh, one of them, in, I think it's in Sudan also. Masjid, this is Masjid al Nilain. Okay, and I think this is the, the one on the left is Masjid al Nilain. And you know, if you, if some of you, and the, the other one, it's uh, the Islamic Center in Rome, okay, by Portuguese, okay. And if you, if you, yani, uh, Remember, in the 1960s and 1970s, there was a, 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 a movement of the high tech, and uh, you know, to, to have a, a huge mosque with, uh, without any column like a uh, Nilain mosque, it was uh, a milestone and and, and the. Uh, yani, uh, influence on, on architectural uh, design and you know in between 1980 and 19 uh, and 2000 i consider this period it's the hesitant period because it was yeah and it's something expected because the postmodern architecture was uh, yeah, uh, dominating and uh, critical regionalism where uh, became uh, the, the 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 main uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, approach and uh, intellectual uh, yani, uh, direction for many architects and it was expected that many architects will follow. Our Khan Award was appeared in 1977 and you know encouraging uh, the, the, yani, the heritage uh, yani, or uh, and, and encouraging the heritage, and but not, not only the heritage as a heritage, but also encourage many yeah, yeah, uh, architectural uh, practices that yeah, borrowed from the history and from uh, heritage. 
And as I said, it was expected, but this influenced mosque architecture. And uh, in fact, يعني, the, the attention to, toward mosque architecture was very minimal and it was not serious because even the Arab and Muslim architects, they didn't يعني, give all their effort to develop the mosque architecture. Uh, <laughs> أستعرض بشكل سريع. أعطيني two minutes. أوكي. خليني أعدي هذا لأن الموضوع في تفاصيل كثيرة. طبعا ما كنت ناوي إني إني يعني أستعرض كل شيء لكن الحقيقة إنه حنا في الفوزان يعني أوكي. award for most architecture. We notice that يعني to bring back the role of uh, mosque as an incubator for architecture in our region and a symbol for identity and urban development, we should cons يعني cons يعني concentrate on the best practices يعني, uh, of mosque architecture in the world. And the the past, uh, the, the last uh, يعني cycle, which was uh, ended uh, this year, uh, 2020 in March, we tried okay, as much as we can to select the best practices. I will go through them. This is in Iran, Tehran. Okay. Uh, this is in Indonesia. Uh, this is in, uh, uh, this is in Amman. You will see some of them is uh, very traditional. Okay, and just to, to realize the crisis of mosque architecture, but some of them is really good examples. This is in Indonesia, and this is also in Iran. You will see how our architecture in Iran is really very progressive. And But you know, the, both examples is uh, yani facing a huge opposition by the mullahs in Iran. <laughs> And the architects, we, I mean, they told us as, uh, they're facing a big problem because it is very progressive, very futuristic approach. Okay. This is, I think, in Algeria, Indonesia, and this is in uh, Indonesia. And, they, you know, most of beautiful mosques, you will find them in Bangladesh and Indonesia, and few in Malaysia, few in Pakistan. But mostly Bangladesh and uh, Indonesia is leading in mosque architecture. Okay, this is uh, in Bangladesh. It's a, it's a wonderful, yeah, spiritual mosque. And this is also in the Indonesia. Uh, this is uh, Bangladesh. This is uh, Sunjalar and uh, uh, and uh, in uh, Istanbul. It's a it's amazing mosque. This one's uh, underground. And this is uh, in Bangladesh, this is Red Mosque, and this is in Lebanon. And it's, it's you know, this an old mosque. It was renovated. And, uh, you know, this art piece being added to this mosque. It's one of the best examples I I saw in, in the past 10 years. Okay, it's very simple, very spiritual, very nice, and it's, it was not uh, يعني costing a lot of uh, money. Can, can we end it in that beautiful mosque, uh, Doctor? معلش. سامحني يعني. I have to. لا خليني أقول لك عن هذا المسجد الأخير لأن هذا آخر واحد. This is also in Egypt. This is Barcelona. It's it's a wonderful because it's also يعني bringing the heritage and the uh, يعني modern with the craftsmanship and one يعني example and I think we discovered that we can find good examples and present them to the world and uh, hopefully next cycle because it's covered the whole world I think inshallah ta'ala we will have a milestone in the, in, in, in the uh, يعني not only in the يعني uh, in, in the architecture practice but also in the intellectual يعني براكتس تولز موسك اركتكتشر. ثانك يو عذرا على الاطاله معليش يعني انا اعطيت وقت كثير للميثودولوجي لاني اعتقد انها مهمه يعني. 
وايد مهمة دكتور and we have so many questions regarding that يعني I wish we could have uh, this conversation that relates to historization of the of Islamic architectural heritage and it's something very very interesting uh, I would leave شوية من ال يعني للتعمق في الموضوع uh, مع ال questions because I can see some questions regarding that point فإن شاء الله لما يجي وقت ال question and answers ممكن نتكلم عنها أكثر um, <تصفيق> Thank you so much, Dr. Mshore. Like, and thank you so much for your enthusiasm. We are so much hooked with your uh, presentation, but it has to end in somehow. Uh, I'm the worst moderator. I would, if it was for me, I would keep you going. <laughs> yeah, no um, problem at all. I, I know that some, sometimes, yeah, I, uh, I, I, uh, I concentrate on certain things and I forget all about other things. <laughs> it's totally fine. <laughs> all right, so uh, shall we move on to our next uh, keynote speaker? And our next guest over here is uh, Dr. Mohamed Zian Bouzian. Uh, Mr. Mohamed Zian Bouzian, uh, he's a senior program specialist at Arab Regional Center for World Heritage. And here is a few words about uh, our guest. He's an architect by training. He holds a master's degree in territories and heritage professions from the University John Monet. I'm sure I'm not sure if I pronounce it right. And a McLean Master in Conservation and Management of Cultural Landscape from the same university. Following a first experience in the field of rehabilitation of historic buildings in France, he worked on reconversion projects in Naples, Italy. And then he joined the Arab States Unit at the UNESCO World Heritage Center, where he specialized in the implementation of the World Heritage Convention together with the other UNESCO culture related normative instruments. During his time at UNESCO, he worked on urban conservation and the implementation of the recommendation of the historic urban landscape in the Arab States. He contributed in the elaboration of the thematic program Heritage of Urban Architecture Modernities in the Arab States within the World Heritage Cities program and conducted several technical assistance missions in the Arab region. So since 2017, Mr. Mohammed joined the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage as a senior program specialist in charge of the design and implementation of the cultural heritage program. Uh, he works closely with the states, uh, members and the World Heritage Center together with the advisory bodies for the effective implementation of the World Heritage Convention. So please help me welcoming uh, Mr. Mohamed uh, Bouzian. Over to you, Mr. Mohamed. Can you uh, open your camera? Yes, it's open. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, for this introduction and uh, uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be uh, with you today, and thank you also for attending this uh, intervention uh, on world heritage and historic Islamic cities and values and attributes. I would like to. Uh, at, the, at the outset, um, thank the University of Bahrain and the Honorable Committee in charge of uh, the organization of this uh, symposium, the first symposium on Islamic art and architecture. Uh, I, I also express my uh, appreciation for uh, Dr. Haifa and all the colleagues for allowing me to uh, intervene today as a keynote speaker with such uh, knowledgeable academicians and professionals such uh, yourself, herself, and Dr. Mshari, who had we had the the honor to uh, host uh, some years ago at the Arab Region Center for uh, discussing the case of historic Jeddah. So, as you mentioned, I work for the Arab Region Center for World Heritage. The Arab Region Center for World Heritage is a category two center under the auspices of UNESCO. It was established in 2012. And um, it's, it, it deals with uh, assisting the World Heritage, um, the, sorry, the Arab states uh, in the implementation of uh, the World Heritage Convention. Its main goals uh, concern the uh, 
ensuring or working for a better representation of the Arab states on the World Heritage List, uh, working towards an effective conservation and management of World Heritage properties through capacity building, through, um, through uh, field projects with the Arab states and the site management teams in charge of uh, properties management and protection, uh, strengthening the network of experts in the field of World Heritage. As you know, we have, uh, mashallah, so many expertise in the field of heritage, but in the field, specific field of World Heritage, we still lack some, uh, we need to reinforce the network of experts. We work on the advice to, uh, to state parties, and we have also some statutory role with, uh, within our mandate under the World Heritage Convention with the World Heritage Center as a category to center of UNESCO. So, um, can you see my presentation? Is it? Uh... Yes, it's clear. Oh, thank you. So, uh, today I will uh, talk briefly uh, about World Heritage uh, b just before getting into the topic of historic Islamic cities, World Heritage as a like significance that is recognized for um, this urban heritage or the cities or urban environment that are mainly considered within the World Heritage List for their Islamic influence and recognized as historic Islamic cities for most of them. I'm not going to talk too much into details about architectural features of Islamic influence in the cities, but mainly about the values thanks to which uh, these cities were inscribed and recognized as uh, properties of world heritage importance of, or of world importance and the attributes that convey these values. So uh, just a brief introduction about world heritage uh, to, uh, to scope the discussion or the intervention. Um, the, 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 the World Heritage Convention or World Heritage is about the history of humanity and the world where we live. Uh, the history of humanity uh, is uh, reflected by the uh, what we call cultural sites, sites that are man-made. Uh, the world is reflected by the natural sites, the sites that are natural. And uh, there is also what we call mixed sites, which are a combination of cultural and natural sites. And then there is also another subcategory of cultural sites, which is cultural landscape which is the, um, the joint or action of man and, and nature together. Each side of this uh, that is added to this list uh, allow us to see clearly or better the, the picture of this history of humanity. There is one particularity about the World Heritage List. It's unlimited. So um, when the convention was established, it was never meant to stop at a certain number. Now we have 1,121st or 21 World Heritage properties, uh, but uh, there is no limit to, 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 to the list because we are now building or uh, making the heritage of tomorrow and we also recognize heritage sites for outstanding values for what they bring to the history of humanity. So most importantly is not the time but it's the value that is added to, to this list. The, uh, there is also something very important. All the sites that are inscribed, whether natural or cultural or mixed, they have the same value or the, the same importance. You can have a 1,000 year old site and also another building uh, belonging to the modern era. They will have the same value regarding world heritage. It's what they add to the list, how they could or how they can help us understand better this history of humanity and the history of the world where we live. So world heritage is also not only a list, it's uh, first of all a mechanism of cooperation, of uh, assistance between state parties to uh, UNESCO. It's protection, it's not only the responsibility of UNESCO or of international organization working or regional organizations working in the field of uh, heritage protection, but it's the responsibility of the international community from the local society, local communities, universities, professionals, academicians, etc., etc. So, a huge number now, 1,121 1, World Heritage Properties, which means we need the, all the, the, the cooperation of all the partners, all the, the communities to protect this site. It's very clearly mentioned in the text of the convention that was adopted in 
1972 in Article 6, the international community as a whole is meant or need to cooperate for the protection of this site. As you may know, the World Heritage Convention uh, Treaty or con was uh, created by uh, an emergency situation. The, uh, in the 60s, there was this huge project of a dam in Aswan in Egypt that threatened with the rising level of water the Nubian monument or what is called also Abu Simbel World Heritage Property which led uh, Egypt and uh, Sudan to ask for UNESCO's help. At that time, there was no mechanism, no uh, framework for this cooperation. So UNESCO launched an international campaign that gathered more than 15 countries' contribution, a uh, huge budget for that time of $80 million, which helped in accelerating the excavation of the site and moving the main component of this magnificent uh, pharaonic site to uh, a place where it will not be threatened by the water. So this uh, initiative or this situation uh, added to the fact that there is all, after the First and Second World War, there was a kind of awareness raising about the necessity to preserve cultural heritage because of all the loss that uh, humanity lost of cultural heritage, especially in Europe. It helped in creating uh, an environment for an, like a convention such as the World Heritage Convention. UNESCO started working with ECOMAS, which is one of the, of the advisory bodies to the convention, to draft the international treaty, which was supposed to be focused only on cultural sites. After it, uh, there was uh, also another organization, IUCN, working in uh, the conservation of nature that was also working at the same time on uh, a similar document for the protection of natural sites. At the end, the stakeholders all together uh, decided to work on the uh, on one convention, which will be uh, in 16 November 72, adopted as the World Heritage Convention for the protection of cultural and natural heritage of outstanding universal value, of outstanding importance. It became the first unique international legal uh, framework for the protection of cultural and natural sites. And there is a very specific um, concept in the convention, which is recognizing the interaction between human and nature and the need to maintain this balance between the two. So the convention is, first of all, as it's uh, said, a convention, it's a legal text uh, that was adopted in 72 because it's a legal text and most of the people working in the field of world heritage are not legal uh, experts. There is also what is called the operational guidelines for the implementation of the convention that was adopted in 77 for the first time. It's regularly uh, updated. It reflects the decisions of the World Heritage Committee. It uh, also helped in assist or assist in understanding the convention and easy or facilitate its implementation. It's a working tool. It's used by most of the professionals that are working in the field of world heritage. It explains the process of uh, inscribing site, the monitoring of this site, the conservation of this site, all the mechanisms that are uh, highlighted in the World Heritage Convention. And also it reflects the evolution of the definition of world heritage. The world heritage was adopted, or the convention was adopted in 72. The uh, operational guidelines regularly are adapted, uh, updated to explain how the understanding of world heritage evolved. At the beginning, there was only cultural and natural sites. Mixed sites were or came early, later. Cultural landscape also. What we call now modern heritage was not considered at the beginning. It was mainly about archaeological sites, monuments, building, and then it became more, it became more and more uh, inclusive of other types of heritage that are of outstanding value, obviously. The main objectives of this legal tool of uh, or international treaty is to identify sites of outstanding universal value. I will explain it quickly uh, later on. Uh, one, once the site is inscribed on the World Heritage List, it becomes a property. So the objectives of the convention is also protection of these properties that are inscribed and the conservation and preservation, which is really the essence of the World Heritage Convention. It's important that sites that are inscribed and uh, the list represent the diversity and uh, the richness of World Heritage 
all over the world, but the most important topic is the conservation of these sites and their preservation. So inscribing a site is not, um, is not the end of the process, but it's only the beginning, because there will be follow-up, there will be monitoring, there will be reporting to the committee and to UNESCO and so on. Uh, the convention main objectives also include the presentation of World Heritage to the public and raise awareness about its importance at all levels and tra the transmission of this uh, heritage to future generations. The main bodies of the convention, I would like just to highlight this because uh, it is commonly um, uh, understood that UNESCO inscribed site. Actually, it's not UNESCO, it's a, a committee um, uh, formed by uh, UNESCO state members. So there is the first or the main uh, supreme body is the General Assembly of State Parties to the Convention. These are all the state parties of the world that adopted the World Heritage Convention. They meet every two years and then they elect what we call the World Heritage Committee. It's 20, 21 state parties that are elected by the General Assembly and that meet every year to discuss the new sites that should be inscribed, the sites that need more uh, protection, the sites that have issues and that uh, the committee need to advise and recommend and take decisions towards helping the state parties in their protection. The committee are represent, or the state parties are represented in principle by experts to this committee. So these are the, the body or this is the body who take decision at the World Heritage level. Then you have the advisory bodies, three international organizations to help the World Heritage Committee in implementing its decision and taking the right uh, strategies for the world for, for World Heritage, the Secretariat or what is called the World Heritage Center. And then later on came what is called now the UNESCO Category 2 centers like the one uh, based in Manama, the Arab Region Center for World Heritage. It's a new, um, a new uh, form of cooperation between UNESCO and state members. And we are 10 regional centers in the world, one in Arab states, in Africa, in Latin America, in Europe, in Asia, and in North America. So the uh, advisory bodies are IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, ECOMOS, International Council on Monuments and Sites. These two advisory bodies' main role is the follow-up of state of conservation, but also the evaluation of new nominations and the, um, the uh, protection of this site. ICRAM is a third advisory body, which main role is the training uh, on uh, conservation, but also follow-up of state of conservation and assistance to state parties with regard to specific uh, topics re related to conservation and restoration. So the outstanding universal value that I talked about is uh, meant or is understood as the uh, cultural or and natural significance that is so exceptional that it transcends national boundaries to be of common importance for present and future generations which means that a site that is inscribed in Saudi Arabia or Bahrain or Machu Picchu or sorry or Peru would main in with regard to the World Heritage Convention the same meaning for everybody everywhere there will be always national uh, national consideration regarding the cultural identity of a site at the national level sometimes at the regional level or at the sub-regional level but the recognition of the international importance will be the same Sites like Qalat um, al-Bahrain, as I mentioned, or Al-Ahsa in Saudi Arabia would mean the same with regard to world heritage to uh, the international community because the committee, the, the committee uh, recognized this value as the world heritage value or of most importance. So the sites are assessed thanks to 10 criteria, six that are cultural and four natural. This outstanding universal value as a concept is sustained by three pillars, the fact or three main conditions. The first is that each site inscribed need to meet at least one of the criteria or one of the 10 criteria. It has to meet the condition of integrity and authenticity with regard to the component of the site, with regard to the credibility of, of, of the value of the site and so on. And it has to be, uh, or it has to be sustained by uh, comprehensive and uh, accurate 
system of protection and management that will ensure the protection of this outstanding universal value for future generation because one of the main objectives is transmission so and as long as all uh, all the three pillars are uh, met the site is inscribed and is protected and if one of these pillars obviously is not uh, ensured there is no outstanding universal value this is one of the also conditions of, of outstanding universal value. So now if we talk about uh, AM or uh, values, when we talk about uh, values, we all know that there are uh, in general uh, different kind of values according to the various fields and disciplines and so on, but also according to the different cultures, each culture has, have, has its own values. Values are uh, could be as historical, uh, aesthetic, environmental, archaeological, etc., social, and so on. But uh, values are mainly created by men or by, by human values. There are these are human values. Values are created by societies. However, there are certain values that belongs to all humanity. We are uh, like we are uh, all in agreement on what is good and what is bad. Such values. Values are uh, mainly intangible. So uh, in the field of culture or in the field of world heritage, values are always uh, reflected by physical anchors and reflections in the site. The World Heritage Convention is a property based convention. So even though we are talking about intangible values, these values have always reflection on the site or physical assets. In, uh, in, in English, it's easy. In French as well, we call attributes, attribute, or uh, it's, it's, it's agreeable. But in Arabic, there is, uh, we usually say al-mizat, al-sifat, al-qara'in, etc. But we have a translation of the operational guidelines in Arabic, which translated the attributes as mizat. And this is uh, a richness of the Arabic. Yani, this is the richness of Arabic in our region. We have some differences between the Maghreb and the Mashraq in calling al mizat or al-qara'in or sifat and also other uh, words in the vocabulary of the convention. But at the end, we all agree that we use the, uh, the official translation of these operational guidelines and we use the words that as are uh, agreed by the Arab states when the operational guidelines were translated into, um, into Arabic. So the attributes, there is uh, this list of attributes that is not exhaustive, that is uh, just for indication, that is included or inserted in the operational guidelines, like the form and the design of the site, the material, the substance, the use, the traditional uh, techniques and management, the setting of the site, the language and the feeling and so on, but all these intangible uh, attributes should be uh, also uh, proved uh, physically on the site. So, regarding the Islamic art and world heritage, or uh, when we talk about world heritage or Islamic uh, historic cities more, more most uh, specifically, the importance of these heritage places, because we are talking about heritage places today, uh, of Islamic art and architecture, go beyond the Islamic the Islamic world to be of universal importance and their significance allow to understand better the evolution of technologies, art, history and architecture of great importance for all humanity. So when I'm going method now to, to talk about some of these values, I'm not getting into much details, but these uh, represent the values that are recognized as important for the history of humanity, whether the development of art, technology, the way of thinking, the way of living, and the, even also the, the spread of Islam because of the importance of this, our religion uh, in changing the, the, the face of the world and so on. So in, um, sorry. In the World Heritage List, there are uh, many sites that have in the description of their uh, OUV, what is called OUV is the Outstanding Universal Value, a strong link with the diversity of Islamic artistry across all the regions of the world. I choose some, um, some uh, examples. 
The first one is the Medina of Fas in Morocco, which was inscribed in 1981. Thanks for uh, that, because it meets the, the second and the fifth criteria. The Medina of um, Morocco in North Africa, Kingdom of uh, Morocco. If we look to the description of the outstanding universal value, this is uh, a text that was extracted from the nomination file, the file thanks, like the file that Morocco prepared for nominating the site to the World Heritage List. In blue, you will find uh, like you will find two colors. In blue is the attributes, in purple of values, and uh, this is how the these sites of of Islamic influence of uh, that that are built and created by. Uh, the different Islamic dis um, dynasties and uh, Hadarat al Islamiya and Mutataliya, this is how they are presented to the committee and to the world. So, if we see uh, now the, the uh, attributes for Fez, for instance, Fez, uh, in, in the case of Fez, one of the main attributes is the architecture and the construction techniques, as well as the uh, religious buildings, as well as other. Uh, Purposes buildings such as house ruling uh, or uh, palaces and um, building of ruling purposes. The these the, these attributes convey the value. The value of the city, one of of course, uh, one of its values. It's one of the largest Medina, evolving in symbiosis, representing a variety of architectural forms and urban landscape. And it's not only representing an uh, urban heritage, but it transmits also a lifestyle, skills and culture that persist and are renewed. Because uh, something also important that was mentioned by uh, Dr. Mshari, the Islamic art was also in, uh, was never isolated. It also, it, it always evolved. It was always uh, uh, influenced by other uh, civilizations, by other um, cultures. Continue with uh, the site values, and we go maybe sorry maybe further into details to the description of the site. We found we find that the city of Fez was inscribed with the criterion uh, as I mentioned two and five. If we see the value that is uh, expressed by the criterion two, the city is a living uh, testimony which exercised a huge influence between the 12th and the 15th century on uh, the development of architectural monuments and town planning in, the, in, 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 in Andalusia and southern part of the Mediterranean. The time span is very important in world heritage because uh, each um, period represents a part of, of the history of humanity. So you would find similar uh, values but never at the same um, exact span of time. One of the values of the site also uh, which uh, meet the criterion five is the fact that uh, the city is an outstanding example of medieval town planning created during the first centuries of the Islamization of Morocco and of uh, North Africa and an, an, original, an original type of traditional land use and town planning which is uh, considered as unique. It, it, uh, the Fez is a city where is, there is a density of monuments of religious, civil and military character, mainly uh, representing this value of the site that uh, transmit the culture of, uh, of, of Fez and that represent the town planning or one of the unique uh, town planning um, pattern in, in, in North Africa during the first years of the Islamization of this region. The second example is the old city of Sana'a, inscribed in 86 due uh, to, to the criterion 4, 5 and 6. The city of Sana'a is uh, considered as an outstanding example of an architectural ensemble reflecting the early years of Islam. So now we were talking about Morocco, about the early years of Islam in Morocco, North Africa. Now we are talking about the early years of Islam. It demonstrates exceptional craftsmanship and traditional human settlement. Among the attributes are the density of rammed earth, 
in the case of uh, FAS, we are also, we were talking about the density of buildings, but there was another material. So in the case of Sana'a, it's the density of framed earth and burnt brick tower, the decoration with geometric patterns of fired bricks, and the minaret, which is very specific, creating a specific skyline of the city, and also something that is uh, somehow unique for the city is the use of the uh, bustan or the basaitin in the in 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 the urban fabric of, of, of the city. The houses uh, so the houses of Sana are among the attributes. They, uh, they, they, they transmit an outstanding example of an, of an extraordinary masterpiece and traditional human settlements. This is criterion five, which is usually uh, related to the traditional land use and traditional uh, occupation of, uh, of land. Criterion six in the field, uh, in, in world heritage, is uh, always recommended to be used by the committee together with another uh, criterion because it's the most uh, representing the most intangible values of, of a site. And uh, here the criterion six is met because Sana is directly and intangibly, or tangibly, sorry, associated with the history of the spread of Islam in the early years of Hijra. The great mosque in this case represent this uh, relation to the value because it was uh, uh, built in six years of Hijra at the first or known as the first mosque built outside Mecca and Medina. The city of Sana'a also contributed in playing a major role in the Arab and Islamic uh, world history through the contribution of historical uh, figures, including uh, the, all the manuscripts that were found there, found there and all this, uh, this spiritual importance. So the city is uh, strongly related to uh, uh, strong belief to personalities, to the spread of Islam and so on. So this is uh, one of the values of, of, of the city of Sana'a. The other example is the Cordoba or the historic center of Cordoba inscribed in 84 and then extended in 94 to include uh, also uh, some modern part with criterion one, two, three and four. Usually World Heritage sites are inscribed by two to three criteria. Uh, there is always one strong criterion, but in the past, state parties used to present the site with several criteria, which is not really uh, uh, easily uh, justifiable with uh, regarding the committee and the evaluation of the of ECOMOS. You will always find one of the criteria that is really a strong criteria. So, uh, as a value in the historic uh, center of Cordoba. Uh, it is said that the, the city is a living expression of different cultures and confessions. It's not only a, representing historic Islamic cities, but it's uh, especially reflecting the city uh, regarding the Roman era and considered one of the finest uh, in terms of architecture, of course, decoration and so on, uh, representation of the splendor of Islamic art. It is also considered a unique artistic achievement in the field of world heritage. Uh, among the attributes, we can uh, talk about the richness of its monuments, the decorations, the mosque that is considered one of the uh, masterpieces of uh, human uh, creativity, and also the fact that it was a ground for uh, construction techniques and its history because it's one of the uh, last remaining of what is what of what was called the Caliphate of Cordoba or Khilafat Cordoba, which is uh, a criterion three and which is representing sites that were uh, uh, considered like um, uh, a peak in such uh, history of cultures. In, the, in this case, it's the case of Islam in Cordoba, uh, in Cordoba and the Khalifa, Khala, the Khilafa al Cordobia. So, the, the Great Mosque, one of the attributes, is considered a unique masterpiece in, uh, in the history of architecture. The influence that the city exercised 
uh, on the Western uh, Muslim art from starting from the 8th century and its influence as well in the development of what was or what will be called later the neo moresque style which we can find mainly in North Africa and uh, the criterion four, which is also related to the buildings, the what we call the typological criteria, it's the outstanding example of the religious architecture of Islam. So this criteria specifically talk about the typology of Al-Asmaf uh, and which are related to um, times and uh, or uh, period of times of global and regional importance to all humanity. The following example is the Medina of Sus. It's uh, also a different kind of historic Islamic city. It was inscribed in 88 with criterion 3, 4 and 5. And the particularity of this uh, town planning or of this Medina is the fact of its rustic architecture or um, because of its location as a coastal town, it has um, it has always been exposed to piracy, to uh, danger from the sea. So the the, 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 the town planning of the of this city is uh, a very uh, unique prototype of military coastal architecture in the first centuries of Islam. And also here among the attributes, we can find all the monuments, the um, the uh, the districts or the quarters that represent this architecture the Ribat, which is a very important uh, building or uh, uh, monument in this case, and uh, its value as it enabled the study of the evolution of Islamic art in its first periods in this, uh, in this part of the world. The, uh, the criteria to which, sorry? So, if I may ask, do you have a lot to go? No, 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 I'm almost done. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the criterion three, or where the um, the, uh, the, the, the where, where the city represents a particular uh, culture, a, part a particular civilization, uh, is an exceptional witness to the civilization of the first centuries of Hijra in this part of the world. It, is, it constitutes also a precious example of, his, of an Islamic city. The criterion for which is related to buildings or the typology of buildings with a specific ribat of Sus, which is an outstanding example of this type of constructions with all its architectural features and uh, components that you can see here in blue. And the last uh, criterion is criterion five, uh, one of the uh, outstanding example of Arab Muslim uh, Mediterranean architectural city. It reflects a particular traditional way of life. It constitutes also a precious heritage that must be safeguarded. The last example is Samarkand. I couldn't uh, not mention it. Samarkand was inscribed in 2001, thanks to criterion one, two, and four. Um, the city is, uh, is uh, considered for uh, the influence it exercised all over the world in the development of the art of Islam or Islamic art, Islamic architecture, and also the modern part of the city, the fact that the city existed for more than 2,000 and a half millennia with continued occupation, with all the, uh, the development of technologies and decoration that this uh, city and all the buildings, all the religious buildings, uh, mosques and mausoleums that are there, rich in terms of decoration, reflects the uh, the uh, or influence development of of uh, the um, architecture, technology, and decoration in in Islam in other Islamic cities, but also in other uh, more let's say occidental cities. The particularity also is that the city include uh, a modern part that was added centuries centuries after the the uh, expansion by, by the Russians the, in the European style, more modern style, etc. And the criterion, it's one of the masterpieces of Islamic cultural creativity. Uh, it played a major role in influencing other Islamic cities and it has also um, its own typologies and its own uh, unique 
kind of architectural uh, of, of buildings that are considered uh, exceptional for their typology. And by this, I will uh, finish my presentation. Thank you, and I'm sorry for uh, taking so long. No, you're absolutely fine, uh, Mr. Mohammed. Thank you very much. You took us uh, a trip around the world and among some of my favorite spots as well. Uh, thank you for this presentation. It was uh, really interesting to know. Uh, I was I was actually part of. I had the pleasure to be part of the uh, the team who prepared the nomination file for the Perling project. So it's very interesting to to see the holistic. Um, idea of, of the heritage list and, and uh, UNESCO's uh, convention. So thank you very much. You thank and you. Uh, Professor Mushari, like you're kind of like a, a encyclopedias of, of uh, all of this uh, heritage that you're talking about. So uh, Dr. Mushari was uh, talking about Islamic heritage and then you went uh, somehow global. I feel like you were, you were both of you, you complemented each other in a way. So, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. So our uh, last but definitely not the least keynote speaker is our very own chair chairwoman of the Department of Architecture and Interior uh, and Interior Design, Dr. Haifa Al Khalifa, and uh, she was our chairwoman uh, since December 2019. She holds a bachelor degree in science and interior uh, architecture from. Imam Abdurrahman bin Faisal University and a master degree in business administration from New York Institute of Technology. She earned her PhD in architecture from the University of Cardiff, uh, Cardiff back in 2017 with a specialization in history of Islamic architecture. Uh, Dr. Haifa is also the chair for the Research Lab of Culture and Architectural Aspects and her primary areas of research includes um, history and historiography of Islamic uh, architecture, cultures, Islamic arts, urban history, and traditional architecture of the Arabian Gulf region and the architecture of the contemporary mosque. So um, welcome, Dr. Haifa, are you with us? Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tamadler, for this nice introduction. And uh, thank you also to our guest speakers, uh, Professor Mishari Naim and Stad Mohammed Wuzayan. And uh, today I will um, present to you my lecture, which is on the subject of the contemporary mosque of the Arabian Gulf. How, uh, however, I will start or I will focus in my lecture on the mihrab of the contemporary mosque of the Arabian Gulf. So, um, Basically, uh, before starting our, our my lecture, um, most of my research is about the architecture of the Gulf, as uh, Dr. Tamadar mentioned earlier, and I'm talk I'm uh, studying how the mosque in the in the Gulf region uh, not developed but transformed, uh, which is really different. Uh, yani two terms are really different in the meaning. I'm not talking about how it's been developed, but I'm talking about how the architectural identity of the mosque of the Gulf region being transformed uh, to a new hybrid um, uh, mosque design or identity, which is uh, being يعني, seen in, in, a, in a many or many cities in the Gulf uh, with different, let's say, different styles. Uh, some of these mosques were being uh, built successfully, uh, referring to the local architecture, and some of them were being uh, influenced by um, the, uh, let's say, another Islamic cultures, uh, architectural cultures. And there are many factors that played a role in, the, in this uh, result, or the, 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 let's say, the end result of these mosques. So one of these factors was uh, the, the decision makers and the government who decide at the end what is the, especially if there was a competition to design a mosque, they will select a mosque that usually uh, what happens, this is especially in the 80s, uh, to reflect a design of 
let's say more of the Ottoman or Mamluk or more of uh, taking some يعني, reference uh, or inspiration from the Persian also style. Um, some of these also were uh, the successful, uh, let's say, the example where, the, for example, the, the Qasr al-Hukum Mosque in uh, Riyadh. These mosques were being built based on the original uh, mosque design and also based on the local architecture identity of the mosque. Uh, I will go through the today in the lecture uh, to shed some light on this uh, topic of the architectural identity of the contemporary mosque of the Gulf, especially the Mihrab. So I will start now with the research or let's say my lecture layout. First, I will define the terms um, which is the geographical and the terms uh, of the, or the what I mean by Mihrab. And also the then I will talk a little bit about the materials and also the method. Uh, which I mean here, the method of my uh, research, which I used to um, to study the contemporary mihrab of the mosque, the Arabian mosque. Then I will talk also about the preservation of the mihrab and how some countries in the Gulf uh, were being uh, successfully preserved the original design of the mihrab, and some of them really um, wasn't the, uh, wasn't that successful. Let's say. And then I will talk a little bit also about the contemporary mihrab and how it's been designed and what is the, the influence uh, that been uh, affecting the design of the mihrab. And also I will uh, at the end, I will um, end my lecture today with some conclusions and results. So mihrab, as you all know, it is the niche, uh, which is uh, usually and always in the middle of the qibla wall. And uh, mihrab uh, being built uh, first in the mosque of the um, the Rasul sallam in Qiba, and the idea of mihrab it wasn't built as a mihrab, but the idea of it was to um, to to have to have it like a, to marking or to direct or to show where is the direction to the qibla or to the Kaaba, uh, and. Uh, we have also seen some examples where the mihrab, especially in the early years of the 20th century, that some of the countries here in the in the Gulf designed the mihrab or built the mihrab with the projection to the outside wall of the qibla and to serve the same purpose, which is to direct the, to the qibla side. Why I'm going to study here and focus a little bit about the aesthetic uh, of the mihrab. Now, in, uh, in Islam, as you all know, we are not allowed to use, um, uh, let's say, uh, figures, uh, whether that would be like in the, in the form of sculptures or paintings uh, of a human being or animals. So uh, any creature with a li uh, living soul will be not be, uh, it is prohibited in Islam to, uh, let's say, portray it in the, in the interior or the exterior of the mosque. So uh, that make the, uh, what happened is that this Islamic principle uh, put a lot of, uh, let's say, the, the, on the, um, uh, shifted the focus of the architect, Muslim architects and craftsmen and artists to use calligraphy, to use geometry, to use um, patterns of motifs and ornamentations uh, such as uh, vegetal or floral patterns. And they used it um, as we seen in the, some of the example shown earlier in the uh, in today uh, by Dr. Uh, Mishari and uh, Mr. Muhammad, uh, some of these uh, were being used excessively in the interior of the mosque, whether it was in the mihrab itself, whether it was on the interior of the uh, prayer hall or, or on the on the um, in the niches or the the arches of the mosque or sometimes even the muqarnas, which uh, Dr. Mishari uh, mentioned uh, was used um, in the past as a structural uh, device or an element, but now it's being used as um, uh, aesthetics uh, or for the aesthetically um, purposes.
So this is the uh, just uh, to show you where what is the the part or geographically sites that we are talking about. So Najd is the area here in the in the central of Arabia, and we are going to talk to to about the northern side of the Gulf, which is uh, the Kuwait eastern side of uh, Saudi and Bahrain and Qatar, and also we will talk uh, in some part about Oman. Uh, to show you how these mihrab been transformed or the variety of style of mihrab and how it's been transformed to a new design or let's say new hybrid modern uh, mihrabs. So uh, this is one of the example of the heritage mihrab found in Oman. And as you can see, this is uh, very uh, intricate in design. Uh, the, the engraved uh, shaped uh, in the mihrab, especially in the side panels and in the top panel, uh, took the shape of uh, medallions, took also the shape of um, leaves, and uh, on the top uh, panel of the mihrab, there is an inscription of La ilaha illallah, uh, which has been uh, also um, used in many uh, mihrabs, the same with the same design in many of the Omani old mihrabs. Uh, here is an also another example of one of the Omani or uh, historical mihrab, and you, as you can see, this is um, uh, يعني, there is a lot of similarity, as I said, and this is in Masjid uh, Al Aujana, which is um, you can see there is a representing a remarkable uh, artistic element expressed, of, um, of course, by the Romans and the use of cut stucco. Uh, and um, we will see later on that the stucco also been used in the Najdi Mihrab, but it wasn't that common as it was used in Oman. So moving on to the Central Arabia uh, or Najd, as you see here in the picture, uh, it was uh, um, the, the, the Najd area to, to, to distinguish between Oman and Najd. Now Najd area was isolated um, as an area, there was no influence uh, or evidence of an influence on the architecture of Nisht from the external, let's say, uh, external influence. However, at, uh, compared to uh, Oman, there was an influence being um, recorded uh, from the Africa or from Persia and uh, also from part of the East uh, Western Asia. Um, the, the organic design or the organic of the architecture of Nisht was being also as um, seen a lot. Um, it was done by the, I mean, the organic was design of the, 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 the Nishdi areas or the Nishdi uh, villages or buildings was one of the most um, uh, significant characteristic of Nishdi architecture. Now this is another example of one of the Najdi mosque and as you see there is no Qubba. Uh, we can see there is uh, the, the minaret itself is taking the shape of um, uh, rectangular shape and uh, the, it, is, it can be accessed by the external uh, ladder uh, or a staircase and uh, this is uh, this is very different in style uh, if we are comparing it to the mosque of the eastern side of Arabia or to the mosque of Kuwait and Bahrain and Qatar. Now the, the other thing we can see here that the old mosque of uh, Najd um, used the niche, uh, the keel uh, arch uh, for their um, the, as a shape for the, not only the, the arches, but also they used it for the mihrab. And the mosque itself is very simple in design. The, the prayer hall opens to the adjacent, the court, adjacent courtyard. Now I had, uh, this is one of my, part of my uh, research where I tried to categorize the historical uh, typology of Friday Mosque in the Gulf. And here I'm, I'm presenting uh, the, the Bahrain and Najd cases. Uh, to the left, you can see that this is some of the categories where uh, the typology of Bahraini Mosque um, uh, is appearing then, um, I mean, sorry, it is, here into the to, uh, which has been taken or inspired by uh, the, the the old mosque of Muharraq and Manama. 
to that, uh, you can see both of them, they had really a major differences. Um, now in Bahrain, most of these mosques are being designed with a manara at the co northern corner of the mosque. And there is usually, um, this is especially in Muharraq, but in Manama, there was um, some example of mosque with uh, one minaret, uh, for example, the Fadl Mosque with uh, two or one balconies. Um, to the right, as I said, this is a more of uh, this is an example of the typology of Friday Mosque in Nejd, and the Menara took the shape of either the, the rectangular shape or the tower shape. The material being used here uh, um, in the in the uh, in the mihrab, as I said, it has. Before going to 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 talk about the material, I would like to to share with you how I. Uh, translated the mihrab as an element in the interior of the mosque. As I said, the functional um, use or why it's been built, it is to direct or to, to show where is the direction to the Mecca or to the Qibla. However, it has a spiritual meaning and the meaning where uh, I think it is uh, be or can be translated is the bond, vertical bond between the secular uh, world and the, the gods or the heavenly skies um, or Allah in the, in the, uh, in the top, in the and uh, the horizontal uh, the horizontal link or bond between the, the worshippers and uh, to Qibla through the mihrab. Uh, so I my methodology of the, the study, I used a comparative analysis where I compared uh, mosque, uh, especially here in my, in my research or in this paper, uh, between the mosque of Najd and Oman. Uh, now the, the the mud brick was, as I said, the as a material. It was the main material used in the the Najd area, while coral, stone, and also mud uh, bricks were also used in the eastern Gulf, eastern uh, coast um, side of the Gulf, and into uh, also in the south in the Oman. Now this is uh, some of the 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 comparative analysis that I have uh, designed or have been uh, studying for um, this paper and I, I listed here some of the mosque in the Najd area and to the right some of the mihrab found in Oman. So as you can see the, the mosque here in the Najd area uh, as I mentioned has the keel arch uh, shape for the mihrab and it is in the center of the Qibla wall. Also, you can see if you can compare it to the one in Oman, it is more intricate in design. Sometimes it has, um, it can it can be colored. And here you can see, and it was a common thing uh, used in the heritage mihrab in Oman, is to insert a Chinese plate or porcelain into the uh, central on, or the top of the uh, mihrab. Uh, here also another example on the bottom to the left, you can see one of the Najdi uh, and uh, the, the shape of triangle, which was one of the most important or let's say al akthar istikhdaman in Najd, which was also being used or characterizing the, the Najdi architecture and being used also in the mosque built by Rasim Badran for the Qasr al-Hukum to um, to also refer to the Najdi local architecture. Here is also another example comparing the, the Najdi Mihrab and the Omani Mihrab, and you can see how it is really uh, different, uh, not only in, in design, but also in the shape and the scale, and uh, also um, the, 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 the material used for the construction. So uh, throughout the examination, I found that uh, the mihrab in Najd, even though that it was very simple and we we didn't see the uh, as much usage of the patterns used as used in the Omani mihrab. However, there was some examples where they used a vegetal and triangle motifs and rosette uh, forms of rosette in some of the uh, old mihrab in, uh, in Najd. 
Also, we have noticed the absence of calligraphy colors and ceramic decoration from the Najdi Mihrab. When you are comparing to the Oman, these things will also appear to, to the researcher. Here we can see the one of the Omani Mihrab in, uh, in a very close uh, any, uh, uh, look to the, to the Mihrab itself. What we can see that there is uh, very um, the, the the Quranic as I said the uh, the Quranic uh, the the al ayat or calligraphy uh, was being used in the in the top panel and uh, this um, this mihrab was being also transformed to the Museum of Oman uh, National uh, Museum of Oman and preserved uh, to the to its original uh, يعني, uh, status. Um, also, we can see that here um, the elements, uh, the outcome here, uh, which I will try to summarize, is that the, the general design element of the two mihrab of Najd and Oman shares a common design of niche, arch, space, but differ mainly in the type and decorative program. Also, uh, in the not only the decorative program, as I said, in the scale and the material used for construction. So it's also been found the, by other historians as uh, Paulo Costa and uh, uh, Mark Horton and uh, William uh, Wilkinson uh, and others. A different source of influence has been also uh, and you witnessed, uh, as I, I, men I mentioned Ariel, not only the the Bergian and the African were, was infl uh, architectural culture that influenced the Omani uh, mihrab or mosque. It's also been the the been found that the Egyptian, Indian, and Yemeni traditional architecture, when being uh, there is a, a reference for these cultures uh, in the architect architecture cultures in the Omani mosque. While as in uh, in uh, Najd, the mihrab maintained its original future, and as I said, it was isolated. There was no uh, influence. Uh, uh, recorded on the Najdi Mihrab or the mosque. However, uh, the most what happened uh, for the uh, in regards to the preservation of the mosque of Najd uh, or the Mihrab uh, in specific that it wasn't really preserved um, or most most of the Mihrabs in Najd was not really preserved uh, in the 60s or 70s or the early a 20th cent uh, cent uh, century. However, uh, there was some efforts being made uh, recently, in the last 20 years or 30 years, by the government of Saudi to protect and preserve uh, the traditional architecture, including mosques and mihrabs. Um, as I said, um, the the aesthetics value of these mihrabs uh, derived from the precise and neatness of the curving of the stucco panels, which here I'm referring to the Omani mihrab. Um, also, it was carried by well-known Omani craftsmen. Most of these craftsmen, when I studied or in my research, I found they traveled to Bergia and they uh, traveled to Iraq uh, and they uh, been uh, a student, let's say, or learning the the the, the craftsmanship of this um, uh, building the mihrab or using the stucco and designing of the mihrab by the craftsmen, Persian uh, craftsmen and Iraqi craftsmen, and then they return back to Oman and use their يعني, what they have learned and implemented uh, these techniques in the Omani mihrab in the past. So moving on to the contemporary mihrab, I'm just going to, to show you here or share with you some of the examples that we have here witnessed in uh, Bahrain and uh, some other examples. For example, this is a Qalali mosque, which is in Muharraq. Uh, this mosque is um, taking the style of the Arabian hybo style design, which is usually being characterized by open courtyard, a flat roofed prayer hall and minaret. Um, 
this is another example, more uh, recent uh, example, which is what, the IT mosque built in 1992 and designed by Abdul Wahid Al Wakil. Abdul Wahid Al Wakil, uh, he's Egyptian architect, and we can see his influence on this mosque. Now, the, the problem here is not how um, the, the, the mosque being designed, it is this mosque, uh, our question here, is it really reflecting the local uh, architecture of Bahrain or not? And all of the Wakil Mosque, if you have a look into his mosque, it says most of uh, most of his mosque is being influenced by Mamluk or by the Nubian. Um, and this has been uh, for one reason. Uh, I think his time as a student or trainee with um, uh, Hassan Fathi had influence on his uh, style and philosophy of design, uh, especially in mosque design. So in this mosque, the Mamluk influence is very clear. We can see it with the design of the Muqarnas and the, the Minaret, and we can see it with the design of the dome. Uh, it's actually, uh, it's, uh, يعني, uh, we're looking at it, we will remember the mosque of the Bin Tolon and also the other mosque in, uh, in Egypt. This is another example also uh, of uh, a recent uh, or let's say more modern mosque of Bahrain. Uh, this is the Arkabita Mosque and it is built in the, if I'm correct, 2004. Uh, it, is, it is one of the mosque that is not conventional, let's say, uh, it wasn't designed with a conventional way. However, the, the design of this mosque, uh, I think Dr. Mishari will agree with me, uh, had some um, futures that uh, we need to have it, yes, and the, the, or reflecting some of the local identity of the, the region or the the Bahrain, uh, the site itself, um, the, with the triangular shapes and also uh, the, the, the material used in this mosque is a, is a material that is sustainable. It is um, material that is environmental, uh, friendly environment. It is مناسبه للبيئه ومستدامه. أيضا this mosque won the first cycle of uh, Abdul Latif Al Fawzan for architecture, mosque architecture. Now the mihrab itself, it's very simple. Um, no calligraphies, no uh, ornaments, no um, any colors there, and the the it is simple, but however it is very emphasized uh, in the wall uh, by the material used uh, and. Uh, especially the, 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 the big panels on the wall of the Qibla wall, where it's, these define the mihrab itself. This is the Qasr al Hukum Mosque, and as I said, this was designed by Rasim, uh, uh, the Jordanian architect, Rasim Badran, and he uh, designed this in 1994. Uh, this mosque uh, resembled the Najdi architecture by the elements used in the in the exterior and in the interior. If you uh, notice the, the minara at the back, which is uh, taking the shape of the tower, at the same time it is a rectangular shape, uh, similar to the old mosque of Najd. The mihrab, uh, on another hand, it's a, a simple mihrab. Uh, used, uh, he used the white marble, which is uh, a local uh, material, and he uh, really, um, he avoided to use the usage of the ornaments or, as I said, geometric shapes or even uh, inscriptions, uh, Quranic inscriptions. Um, how the, the, the design, it's, uh, it's uh, the thing here, we can see that he did not use the shape, the keel R shape, but the thing is he tried by by using the light or playing with the light to emphasize the, the mihrab concave space. So in conclusion, I would say that the design of counter mihrab in the Gulf region became less aesthetically appealing and in many mosques represent an external architectural cultural influence that do not portray the essence of the local architectural identity of the place. And in some cases, as we say, we, we just uh, now uh, see that uh, the mihrab either become uh, extremely uh, detached from being um, from the Islamic uh, principle design or Islamic uh, architecture characteristic or design or become more of the prototype built everywhere 
uh, as a copy paste uh, design uh, without really um, giving a lot of attention to its cultural um, and uh, spiritual value uh, as an element, very ele important element at the mosque. And that's the end of the lecture. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Uh, and to uh, Professor Mshore and the I can invite you back and open the camera. Thank you so much for this. I know we're running uh, out of time, but it's such a rich uh, information and very much. Uh, uh, I hope the attendees were um, as very much enjoying it as as me as well. Uh, maybe we can take a few questions if that's OK with you all. Um, so the first question uh, that by the time that Professor Mshari was uh, uh, presenting and the question is how do you define Islamic architecture? I noticed that in the timeline prepared by your students, the focus is on the main monumental buildings that are usually displayed in most books on Islamic architecture. Yeah, it's, um, in fact, uh, I'm against, uh, as I said, the notion of uh, Islamic architecture. And yeah. uh, my, my definition is uh, for Islamic, uh, for the architecture in Islamic civilization. This is, this is what, uh, and I believe that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, different uh, types and um, styles of uh, Islamic architecture. If we, cons if we consider this uh, notion as uh, to, descri to describe the architecture, because uh, we rarely find the Christian architecture or uh, Buddhist, Buddhist architecture, Hindu architecture. It's a, usually architecture is something can be uh, modified and created, recreated, developed. Uh, and, uh, according to the time, place, technology, environment, and it's uh, as we said, it's, it's, a, it's part of the inclusiveness of Islam, not uh, something uh, we can say it's haram or halal. This is why um, uh, I have my own definition for the architecture of Islamic civilization. Uh, and we, we use the monumental building as an example but but it's not the uh, it was not meant that the only monumental building is the uh, the one that reflect uh, islamic character as i said we have these two levels of uh, decision making process the incremental decision making process in the islamic uh, arabic islamic cities that generate the neighborhood, the houses, the lays, the irregular forms, while the macro uh, level where the monumental build, building were generated. Okay, and both uh, levels were uh, any, uh, both in, in parallel and characterized the Arabic Islamic cities. And you cannot separate the monumental from the uh, yeah. vernacular. Okay, and you cannot understand the vernacular without really referring to the monumental knowledge. It's all intertwined, and yeah, I mean, this uh, definition uh, so, of the term is still like uh, yeah. being answered and being researched. Uh, yeah. I think it's always changing and always morphing. Uh, yeah. why, why do we need to define it? And um, I think this is also my point of view, and I, I, you know, you actually mentioned it as well in your presentation uh, about how to do it, like, uh, um, the definition of Islamic architecture. There is also another question. It says, does this method methodology of criticism apply to all culture and history products? For example, is it universal? I think um, this also goes to you, Dr. Mshari, about yes, the methodology. Yes, yeah. yes it's, it's, it's universal. And uh, uh, you know, the specificity of, of our culture, I think it's an illusion. Okay, I, we know that we are special. Every culture is special. Okay, and uh, if we say we are special and others not special, I think this is really very 
stage. And this is why when we think, we should think from a, a global perspective, that's from a universal perspective, rather than uh, say, oh, this is only for uh, yeah, yeah. Islamic yeah. civilization. It's not only for Islamic civilization. We have our own jurisprudential uh, system, and other cultures that they have their own. We will be uh, different because we have our own yeah, specific uh, values and but this is not to say that we are special or we are different and i think if we are uh, yeah, uh, looking for uh, a theory a new theory for architecture that yeah, uh, cover all, uh, all uh, uh, types of architecture in some civilization we should think from as a يعني, universal uh, member rather than a يعني, uh, member that's separated and from the uh, the uh, يعني, uh, the global family. Yeah, I think this also falls within what uh, Mr. Mohammed was talking about about the certain criteria as well. Uh, um, uh, the thing that you're looking for in terms of like uh, the World Heritage List. Um, what do you think, Dr. Mohammed, about being having universal methodology or values? Yeah, absolutely. You're right. <clears throat> like uh, Dr. Amshari was saying, we we uh, we there are cult values according to cultures, to societies, but we recognize the global importance of uh, certain values according to the uh, shared understanding of these values. So when we are talking about uh, architecture, art, it's not only important for the Islamic world, as we mentioned before, but for the world. So what it, what these architectures, what these technologies means to other societies, to other cultures, which is of utmost importance of, or, or which is of uh, an, an international importance. So that's why I think I agree with you completely and with uh, Dr. Anshay. We have uh, different uh, appreciation of uh, Islamic architecture than other cultures and societies, but uh, there are certain um, values that we all share according to what these buildings represent or these uh, technologies represent to uh, the humanity as a whole. So. These values that we all share are the same, but of course, we have our own uh, understanding and appreciation of our own culture and so on, and this is also very important. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. There is also one more question for you. Listing one site in the World Heritage List, how does this act to the site itself, the local people and the country? Isn't it considered a globalization or universal universalization? Heritage? Yes. That's one of the most uh, difficult questions to answer <laughs> because uh, when a site is inscribed on the World Heritage List, first of all, it's a recognition or international recognition of uh, the uh, heritage of a country, of a region, of a place, of a locality at the global level. So this will bring uh, and let's be, uh, let's talk also, frankly, now heritage is also uh, about economy and the development of uh, heritage is very related to the economic development of the territories where this heritage is located. So from this aspect, heritage will bring uh, attention, will be shared, so there will be uh, a sort of uh, tourism, heritage sites, world heritage sites, when they are inscribed, they have what is called the management plan. Within this management plan, there is usually also an exit, uh, sustainable tourism management plan. So in principle, the site is inscribed for recognition, for uh, understanding, for uh, visitation by tourists, but within a specific framework. Do not overuse uh, the site, but also to uh, create an economy out of this uh, heritage place. But there is also all of the interest that is brought to the site uh, through the uh, technical aspect of the World Heritage Convention. There will be a mechanism that is called the reactive monitoring. 
time that there is a problem within a site, it is uh, the committee who, with the, the advisory bodies, with the World Heritage Center, with the important community of experts follow up the state of conservation. They give advice. There is also some uh, sites that are uh, that benefit also from what is called the World Heritage Fund, which is uh, a fund within uh, the World Heritage Convention established to uh, provide assistance to certain sites in countries that are less developed or that uh, need assistance or financial assistance. There are also uh, now foundations, organizations such as Alif and others that help sites that are in difficult situation. And so inscribing a site means also that site will have uh, technical assistance, but also financial assistance. Now, in terms of globalization, I don't think uh, in this case it's uh, uh, an issue. It's not globalization because as we mentioned in the beginning, each site inscribe add a value, and this value is different from what other sites bring to the uh, World Heritage Mosaic and the history of humanity. It's, I think, in my view, it's the contrary of globalization. It's the fact that we all share the sites to understand each other better and to uh, live in a more coherent uh, international environment. Remember that. Like, Organization like UNESCO were created at the end of the Second World War to uh, create a ground for cultures to share their uh, differences and understand uh, different cultures and so on. So this uh, mechanism of world heritage or the world heritage, in the, on the contrary, help to understand others' differences and uh, appreciate other differences as part of the world uh, history and the world uh, heritage. Yeah, it's more like uh, celebrating global diversity and maintaining it and preserving it for everyone to see and share and, and so on. Um, uh, maybe I can just pitch in because I'm a moderator. I can ask my questions. <laughs> um, uh, forgive my limited knowledge about uh, the, the different uh, parties that can also participate in preparing this nomination file for for UNESCO, but uh, I'm just wondering the role of education in what, doing what you do. Um, is there any plan or are there any plan already uh, to implement it in kind of uh, educational curriculums about uh, architectural heritage or, or research? Um, I don't know, any thoughts about that? Because I'm very much interested in how the role of education plays part in it. There, there is a um, um, there is a huge uh, focus on the education as uh, part of the implementation of the World Heritage Convention. Unfortunately, uh, in our region, we have few master programs, for instance, at the university that teaches World Heritage. It's part of uh, some universities' curricula, but it's very uh, it's not um, there are now uh, hopefully some programs that are dedicated to cultural heritage and that also address world heritage properly uh, i know the now the university of sharjah with ikram athar they have a new master uh, in uh, in the conservation of cultural heritage where we intervene we uh, also there are another there is also a program at the World Heritage Center called the Education Program, mm. which uh, gather um, uh, two, three, uh, at two, three occasions every year, youth and um, uh, young generation from different parts of the world in uh, what is called the Youth Forum. Uh, sometimes it's, there is also one before the World Heritage Committee and they bring uh, students from uh, many countries, many universities to work together on specific projects. Uh, there is also another uh, aspect which is the UNESCO chairs. There are UNESCO chairs that are uh, mainly focusing on one of the aspects of World Heritage or World Heritage Studies in general. But um, as I said, like universities became now it's, it was, they were not mentioned in the convention at the beginning, but with the development and the evolution of the concept of world heritage, local communities, universities became full part of world heritage. And the uh, countries and state parties are um, advised to always uh, involve universities when they prepare nomination file uh, with expert, with local communities and so on. Because 
universities, you have the knowledge, you have the research, you have the studies. When you need to work on a World Heritage Site, you need to gather many uh, sources of information. You need to build the knowledge that exists already, but in a certain or a particular uh, way of telling a story about the value of a site. So yeah. it is important that universities should be involved more and more in the field of World Heritage. There are, as I mentioned, the education program, the option of UNESCO chairs, we are working now on preparing at the Arbigen Center a UNESCO chair with the university in Oman. Um, there is also the fact that universities are all encouraged to include at least in their uh, program of uh, architecture and design at least once a year uh, a module or a course on world heritage on explaining what is world heritage to at least give a hint to students in their curricula about what is world heritage and influencing maybe them to choose a specialty after they, they finish their graduation. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mohammed. There is a question for Dr. Haifa. Uh, looking at the different approaches in mihrab designs and the origin of the inspiration behind the design, has this strength of the mihrab as a purpose or function in the mosque? Has any of these approaches found to be enhancing spirituality of the space and indulgence in the spiritual focus? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Tamadar. Um, I think the design of the mihrab could also play a, a major uh, role in enhancing the spirituality of the, as I said, of the mosque. And uh, now we've seen some, uh, يعني, they currently they are trying to put a lot of focus, uh, especially in the mosque that been built some examples in the in Europe. They are trying to focus on how to design a mihrab and I saw so, uh, many uh, examples, especially in Germany and uh, in Bosnia, where the mihrab actually it has uh, uh, a shape uh, or um, more the, the, the focus of the prayer hall. Uh, it is it is became the center the, the mihrab became the central of the the prayer hall and it has and uh, let's say that a lot of studies being done into how the light and sound especially can be uh, the mihrab respond to these uh, two interior elements and in europe they have um, as i said um, successfully adapted or uh, yani built some of these mihrab by studying very well the, the the sunlight, the interior light, the artificial light, and also the the, the sound uh, system and how the mihrab designed or the concave space, either concave or not concave, uh, being uh, can respond to the sound. It's uh, in the, inside the mihrab, inside the, the mosque. Mm. That's a quite interesting way of, of uh, looking at the mihrab as an element and how it would be something that could either enhance or uh, decrease the spirituality. I think it's something that really can, we, cannot be measured or um, it depends all on the end user and how, how they behave in the place. Um, I let, think me, let, me, let me comment in, in the mihrab yeah. because in many cases we found, in, especially in, the, in Asia, the, the mihrab is uh, either it's an open wall towards uh, water elements, uh, outdoor water elements, or a piece of glass transparent. And this is uh, a new and different way of uh, thinking about mihrab, is that attracting the eye, bringing the light to the mosque, rather than it's a niche in the wall, as we uh, saw in the, in, the, in the past and in the you know, historical buildings. And uh, I, I think, uh, a few examples in the third cycle of Al-Fawzan Award. Uh, it's presented in the book. I don't know if you received the book, Lahra al Makan, and uh, English and Arabic. Maybe we'll send it uh, to you very soon. Uh, many, many uh, mosques, and the short list, it's, uh, it's only an avoid. It's, it's, it's only an open wall towards a water element, which is, I think, I think it's a different uh, way of thinking about mosque architecture. Yeah. And uh, maybe uh, Dr. Haifa should consider this in, the, in her future studies. Yeah. 
yeah, because uh, it's really a uh, different direction of uh, thinking yeah. about uh, Mahrab and mosque architecture. Yeah. All right, I think we have already uh, <laughs> uh, exceeded our time more than uh, expected, but it was a very enriching conversation. I would, on behalf of all the attendees, on behalf of the organizing committee of this uh, symposium, I would like to thank the three of you, uh, Professor Mshari, Mr. Mohammed, and Dr. Haifa. Thank you so much. I've Thank learned you. so much from you, and um, I'm definitely like we're we're we might need to carry on this conversation into into another symposium because uh, there are so many things to talk about. Like, for example, what you said, uh, Professor Mshari, about um, revisiting the history of of the Islamic heritage and and changing the meaning of the notion rather than the notion itself. I was really caught up with that. It was uh, very interesting how you put it. So um, I'm looking forward to meet you maybe personally one day. Sorry, we could have Inshallah. like had tea or, or snacks after that. Inshallah. <laughs> but, uh, it, will, it, will, it will be my pleasure. <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah, we'll see each other uh, personally. And maybe next year we would have a proper symposium with uh, a uh, proper uh, personal <laughs> connection. <laughs> Thank you so much and have a lovely evening, everyone. Um, thanks again. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. For, Thank you for this interesting event. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.